So when the Quad assembles, what kind of issues are the leaders going to deliberate on? What kind of strategies are they going to talk out? What are the challenges that these talks might address? And what are Japan's expectations from this meeting? To discuss this and more, I spoke earlier today to Koichiro Matsumoto. He is the Deputy Cabinet Secretary in the Japanese Prime Minister's office. Also, Nancy Snow, a geostrategic expert. Here's what the two of them told me. So my first question is to you, Koichiro. Japan is hosting uh, leaders from three countries, uh, three allies of of the Quad. What is the expectation from the engagements, especially from India, as India and Japan mark 70 years of diplomatic engagements? Yes. Well, first and foremost, uh, we are truly honored to be the host of this wonderful meeting, uh, second in-person uh, uh, leaders meeting of Quad. Now, um, the, as for the expectations, I think uh, top on the, on the agenda will be uh, Ukraine, um, Russia and aggression in Ukraine and uh, uh, broader ramifications in international politics. That will be very much top on the agenda. And on top of that, uh, we will be talking about economic issues as well, because there are uh, various uh, economic uh, well, uh, working groups uh, in place. Uh, so we will be talking about uh, space, cyber, uh, vaccination, cooperation, uh, as well as uh, infrastructure and so on and so forth. And uh, plus there will be a uh, bilateral summit meeting with India. And the great thing about Japan-India um, uh, leaders meeting is that it will be a success. <laughs> it is you know, guaranteed. You know it in advance. You know, you know it in advance. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the two leaders have been enjoying their chemistry. Uh, and this is the second meeting in two months and they're really enjoying the excellent uh, condition of the bilateral relationship and in March as you well as you're well aware we have come up with this uh, five trillion yen target of uh, uh, investment to to India and I think the two these we, we I, I don't want to sort of prejudge what it's going to be uh, uh, agreed but I'm sure that uh, there will be talks to uh, on how to encourage Japanese companies to uh, invest in India uh, to that end. Well, you work in the Japanese Prime Minister's office and you have a front row view of what happens and how the planning is done. What do you think is that secret ingredient that makes this relationship uh, go stronger every time the two leaders meet? Well, um, as I mentioned, this is a, a, a personal relationship between the two leaders. We, uh, I think, um, the uh, what it takes is a, um, uh, a charisma of the two leaders and uh, the chemistry between the two leaders. And we have a lot of, you know, things to talk about in economic terms, but also in security terms. Uh, we have seen so many uh, interesting development of events so far, not to mention the Malabar exercise, joint exercise uh, with all the Quad countries are on board. And also, of course, uh, we are utilizing AXA uh, in the individual training between India and Japan. So uh, we have a different uh, uh, kinds of uh, wings of cooperation and that makes the two countries cooperation very exciting. Indeed. Uh, uh, Nancy, uh, he started uh, the first answer by talking about Ukraine and that has been a concern for India. Uh, we do not want uh, uh, or, or India does not want Ukraine uh, to be hijacking the Quad agenda because there are a lot of security concerns in the region. How do you see this playing out will, with, with India safeguarding its own interests and, and position and the other Quad members saying that a stronger stance needs to be taken against Russia? You know, I'm still very optimistic that we can get beyond uh, the terrible crisis in Ukraine because these four Quad member states are here to address what I'm calling the four E's. In Japan, they've had the three C's to avoid uh, COVID-19. The four E's, though, around the quad are energy, environment, education, and, uh, and also entrepreneurialism. It's such a full agenda that you, you have to see sort of a brighter future. Not the security to. goals? Security is always there, but when you talk about vaccine diplomacy, that's a security issue. Education is a security issue. Look at India and its involvement in study abroad, international exchange. Look at the power of the diaspora with the Modi, the personal type diplomacy. It was also mentioned the charisma 
uh, between Kushida and Modi. You, you can't even uh, put, a, put a price on that. And that's why I think that around the table we have much to learn. When I say we, I'm here as a resident, I'm a U.S. citizen, but this region has a lot to learn from India. India, the most populous democracy in the world. India, with seven border countries, including Afghanistan and China, it can be the role of a mediator, a teacher. And so we don't let that which divides us become the central point. We can get well beyond this. It's very exciting for me as an international relations observer because I see so much promise here. And also give a message for people to be involved because as a public diplomacy person, it has to be from the bottom up as much as elite countries coming together. So I don't know, I'm looking forward to the Quad meetings to come, but I think this Quad meeting, this Quad summit in Tokyo could be transformative. And I really believe that it can be because of all of the new rules of the international order that are taking place here. And the and this population, this is the largest population now. Asia is the focus from around the world. Even Joe Biden has said, you know, what happens elsewhere, it's going to happen in Asia, greater Asia. So it's an exciting time. There will be some convergences and divergences, which you mentioned before. But again, that happens with people in interpersonal relations. And so nations are no different. It's Indeed. comprised of people. Indeed. Good to see your optimism. Both of you striking a very optimistic note. Uh, but specifically on security, today the US president made a very interesting statement that is making all the headlines now. And he said that uh, America is prepared to militarily intervene in case China invades Taiwan. Would you say that a statement like this is a bit premature? I would say that, uh, well, we uh, have listened very carefully to what President Biden had said in the uh, joint press uh, conference with the Prime Minister Kishida. And his statement was very, statement was very, very strong. And of course, uh, we support uh, U.S.'s stance on this matter. I mean, the way I look at it is that, you know, we have seen so many attempts being made to change the status quo, uh, not just in Ukraine, but also in Indo-Pacific, and particularly in East China Sea and South China Sea. And we are in need of a strong United States de deterrence, extended deterrence in this region. Uh, so all in all, we are in support of what uh, United States government and United States President uh, Joe, uh, Mr. Joe Biden is saying. Uh, you know, Nancy, the U.S. has been accused of, uh, well, in a way, whipping up tensions. You know, the same happened with Ukraine. Uh, uh, the West kept saying, we stand by Ukraine, we will support Ukraine. And eventually, when the war happened, uh, some countries were only sending helmets. Uh, and, and we see what Ukraine looks like now. And I understand that there is very much a threat and a challenge posed by Beijing. Uh, but to say it explicitly that we will militarily intervene, do you think that uh, precipitates a crisis? Were you talking about militarily intervene possibly in Taiwan yes. or okay. <laughs> uh, let's hope not anytime soon. And you know, with the quad, as much as we put it in a security context, remember the origins, the sort of uh, whispers of the quad came out of an international humanitarian crisis way back when in 2004, December with the Asian tsunami and earthquake that took so many lives. So again, when we talk about security, we have to think global, we have to think uh, broader than just military solutions to what will be chronic conditions of uh, rights of sovereignty and dissension that is ongoing in this region. And as, as much as we have to anticipate uh, a possibility, I don't think it's a probability anytime soon. Now, there are going to be those who disagree with me, but if you put the conditions in place of negotiation and diplomatic dialogue and keep people talking, for instance, Japan regularly talking with China, regularly talking with South Korea, as much as it may be talking to the U.S., that's very helpful. Talk alone won't resolve these conflicts but it can help to get through some of the misunderstandings and even misinformation 
that perpetuates. I want to add that I've taught for years at Tsinghua University in China and uh, have had uh, an experience there with the Schwarzman College that welcomes young global scholars from around the world. There's a promise in the educational sphere that we don't talk enough about because we don't think of education as a security element, but I believe strongly that it is. Final question. The new Australian Prime Minister, you know, the swearing-in was done in record time to make sure that he could make it for the Quad Summit. Uh, what are your expectations? I have high expectations for a new Prime Minister, obviously. I mean, uh, the election is the reflection of the healthy political debate in the domestic politics, and we look forward to working with uh, the new Prime Minister of Australia. Thank you very much. It's a very exciting time to be in Tokyo. Even those who had written off the quad, I think, are looking forward to see what happens tomorrow. Thank you for your time. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vion is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move.